What up, what up, what up? Welcome into another edition of Green with Envy. As always, this is your boy Will Weir checking in. How you doing? How you living? Living real good tonight, I hope. Joining me as he does each and every time, my best friend, co-host, and the coach of our podcast, the one and only Greg Manakis, post-game potting with the boys after the beatdown of the year. What's popping? Grant Williams running point guard. That's what's popping. <laughs> Last five minutes of the game. I was I was wondering. I was like, Peyton Pritchard is not dressed for tonight. There's no JD Davison. That's a, these are the things that are going through my mind. I was getting yeah. really excited. I was like, is Joe gonna leave Derek White on the court all 12 minutes of the fourth quarter for the first time all year? Or all big lineup. All big we, lineup, we baby. Get the Grant Williams point guard show, which we did. It was beautiful. I loved every second. Got, of got it. a little bit of Hauser handle on the side, little step back, little step back, Jimmy. So yeah, I mean, you had texted me. So first of all, just an amazing feeling coming on tonight, being able to to podcast after this game. We talked about this, I think, a game or two ago, where there's some nights that you got to muster up the energy. The energy is booming. It's booming through the mics. Greg's going to have to set down the audio. Got to make sure that we kind of <laughs> level this out because this was just a beatdown of epic proportions to the point where, you know, as we're talking – the last, not even just the last 12 minutes, basically the last quarter and a half was a guessing game as to how long the Jays were going to be out there and Derek White and Brogdon. And can we go put Rob Williams in some bubble wrap, please? Like, can we just put him off to the side? That was kind of the drama in, in massive air quotes drama of the night. And, you know, even for the TNT broadcast, we were, we were interviewing Cheryl Crow with live <laughs> basketball action happening on the court because they were looking for a way to fill time in a 40 point game. That's the type of night that the Celtics just had against the one seed Milwaukee Bucks. I know we've given Joe Missoula a ton of shit for like not taking out people until a couple minutes left in the game, but not having anybody on the court for an entire 12 minutes felt like an eternity. Like there was a whole nother universe, a whole nother world that existed in those final 12 minutes that almost made me forget like what happened in the first three quarters. Yeah. Like I, I have some notes written down here and the, obviously they're going kind of reverse chronological on my notes. And I'm just like looking at the last things I wrote down point grant. Thanasis, do I agree with Reggie Miller for the first time? Like, are we gonna win by fifty? Goran is Goran Dragic like gonna bring them back all the way from the jaws yeah. of defeat? Like all these things that I'm writing down, just like laughing at how silly it was. I forgot that they cut to a Cheryl Crow interview. That was so silly. Yeah. That's how the fourth <laughs> quarter started. Cheryl Crow on the sidelines with the game minimized. Well, you know, with with that, there's no nowhere else to go with this, Greg. Let's let let's do it. Let let's queue up a morning box score here. Your Boston Celtics take down the number one seed Milwaukee Bucks tonight, one forty to ninety nine. I'm gonna repeat that real quick because that is not a mistake. One forty to ninety nine, and we're just going right into the Celtics box score here. We're gonna leave the Bucks just to the side for a minute here, and we're just gonna revel in this victory for a minute. Only place to start is with the tandem of Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Jason Tatum goes for 40 points and eight rebounds. Jalen Brown goes 30 points, five rebounds, five assists. Jalen Brown also shot 13 of 20 from the field, three of five from three. Tatum himself was 12 of 18 from the field, eight of 10 from three, as well as eight of eight from the free throw line. Al Horford, 14 points on five of eight shooting, knocked down four threes so far. No J.J. Reddick curse on on Al Horford from the old man in the three to be seen. He did mention that in the podcast. So I thought it was pretty funny about the Derek White slump. So we'll see. But hopefully that stays away for now. Marcus Smart has 10. Malcolm Brogdon, 14 points off the bench. Greg, this game was so built up and especially coming off the downer that was the Wizards game in which that – Regardless of the Celtics getting the win tonight, their chances of the one seed are still very slim. We'll talk mm -hmm. about that here in just a little bit. And a lot of that is due to what happened in that Washington game. But man, could you get two different teams between the game against Washington and this game tonight against the number one seed, full strength, fully healthy Milwaukee Bucks? This team is, is just bringing us for a ride. And at the same time, we also kind of know what to expect. Where do you want to go with this, Greg? There's let's, there's a lot that we could talk about. Yeah, let's start with all the positive stuff. Talk about the Jays. Uh, I was, you know, Jalen Brown starting the first quarter as he does so often. 17 points in that first quarter just came out absolutely in fuego. Three-point ball going down. I think he was three for four from three in that first quarter. 
Um, and then the fact that Missoula decided to kind of switch up the rotations a little bit in that first quarter, I really enjoyed seeing that where uh, Tatum came out, I think around the six minute mark, and then he brought him back in around the three minute mark. And uh, normally at that point, he would sub for Jalen Brown. And they decided to leave Jalen Brown in the game um, to finish out the first quarter. Those are one, those are the types of things that I like seeing little moments of progress out of Missoula where he's he's recognizing we have. A, he was good have, tonight, man. His, he, was, it, he was great. The, the rotation when this game mattered in the first th- uh, two and a half quarters, he was really good tonight. So, like you said, we give we give him criticisms when we feel that they're due. We got to give him his props tonight. I thought tonight was very well handled. Yeah, and it's easy to say, like, he, he did a good job as a coach when we, when we went by 40. Yeah. But <laughs> his rotations definitely contributed to the Celtics playing great basketball. Which is Shockingly, awesome. timeouts weren't an issue in this game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but 70 points combined between the Jays. There was at one point late in the third quarter where this, the Jays were outscoring the Bucks by themselves. It was like 70 to 69 at one point. <laughs> it was just completely silly to watch what Jason Tatum did. Eight for 10 from three. That was the... Those are the Jason Tatum games that we had become accustomed to and everybody was expecting him to come out after the All-Star break scorching hot like mm-hmm. we saw tonight. And he, he was kind of just getting dirty 30s for a couple weeks, you know, not playing great basketball. And tonight was the last ditch effort out of Jason Tatum to salvage his MVP campaign. I was thinking to myself, that was another <laughs> thing that was going through my head. It's like, yeah. if Tatum did this over the last six games and does it again on national TV against the Sixers next week, like, does he... Th- sneak his way back into that conversation does he maybe get a top three spot i think it's probably a little too late for that but i do think this 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 game did have mvp implications more so on on the yana side because i think if this is a game where he came out and really put his mark on it he's kind of slid to i think in at least in the national landscape when i listen to podcasts he slid to number three and so i thought he could have propelled himself i think Tatum, if you saw the the new Tim Bontemps straw poll that came out, Tatum's pretty securely at four, but was pretty far away from the top yeah. three. That makes total uh, sense. That makes total. I think that's probably about right. I think that's probably where it will end for Tatum. But on the Tatum note, I, I was having this thought earlier, and you kind of nailed it a second ago, where after the All Star break, you know, we we've been criticizing him for being a top fifteen guy instead of a top five guy. That's basically been what it kind of comes down to he was getting dirty 30s he was still getting 10 rebounds five assists and the three-point shooting wasn't there well it was there tonight and tonight you saw an aggressive jason tatum like i know he hit eight threes but a lot of that started from him going to the basket early in the game and then later on he had that onslaught of threes where i i kind of liked him getting a little spicy with joe angles i like that he was pissed off he's like you think joe angles is gonna guard me in a series and you saw him get you know, a little bit pissed off and you saw he was just, he just wanted the ball. And then, you know, Tatum's one of those guys that we've seen when he gets going, he gets going. Like there isn't a lot that you can do to stop him. And I was thinking earlier today that man, Tatum really needs one of these FU games just to remind people that, listen, Giannis is amazing. Jokic is amazing. And beads. I mean, these guys are all great, but don't you dare think the Celtics don't have a guy that can go toe to toe and can do that type of shit when it needs to get done. And this is the same building tonight, the same building that he went and got 46 in game six in an elimination game on the road. And so for him to come back and do this tonight with the national spotlight, there's only two NBA games tonight. So everybody that's watching basketball tonight is watching this particular game or was watching this game as it was going on. And so I think this is a big reminder of what this team can be with the two J's firing on all cylinders and what this team as a whole can look like, because I I think this effort has to start the effort that has to start with the Jays, but it goes beyond that. I think there's a lot of different parts of this team that that showed what they can be, and it's why I've never wanted to give up despite the nights of the Oklahoma City Thunder, despite three <laughs> losses to Orlando Magic, despite that loss to the Wizards. It's why I can't quit this team because of how dynamic this team can be on nights like tonight. Yeah, it's funny. I have a note written down here of the types of teams that give the Celtics issues. So I have the Thunder the Pacers, <laughs> uh, the Bulls, the Magic, you know, all these teams. That all these title contenders that are <laughs> that are in the mix. And it, it just showed – so I was speaking with Adam Taylor, uh, our other co-host, on Instagram Live before the game. That's also, for those of you that are listening, something to uh, just be on the lookout for if you're on Instagram before big games, maybe before every game. We haven't decided the schedule yet. Uh, two of the three of us are going to be hopping on Instagram Live just to chop it up before the game. 
And I was talking about how the Bucks really don't strike fear in my heart as the style of play. Like they're a very methodical, deliberate team, and they don't really have a lot of athleticism outside of Giannis. So teams that give us issues are teams that sp- uh, spread you out, have multiple guys that are making decisions and are really young and athletic. And that's not the Bucks, right? The Bucs, yeah. they can beat the Celtics. I think they, they very well could beat the Celtics in a seven game series, but they're going to do it in a way that is conducive to the Celtics being in every game. And it's going to be really hard for the Bucks just to blow us out in a game just because of the way that they play and the way that um, the Celtics just match up well with that. Uh, but let's t- take a quick break here, Will. And we come when we come back from the break, we can uh, talk about rotations. We can talk about other game plan strategies. All right. So let's let, let's stay with the box score for one more minute, Greg, before we go to the bigger picture of Celtics, Bucks, playoff implications. Let's 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 go there in a second. But I want I want to just touch on a few more guys here that I think need to get called out. And one of the next guys I want to go with was a topic that we had a few episodes ago was that Robert Williams coming off the bench, Lob Williams, Time Lord, whatever you want to call him. I don't I don't care tonight. Tonight, the nicknames can fly. Bobby Bitcoin sky, flying sky high tonight. I thought the Rob Williams that we got tonight, who had seven rebounds, seven assists, four blocks. God, I'd love to see four blocks from Robert Williams. He only played 18 and a half minutes tonight, and that could have even been really 15 if Joe Mazzula didn't want to give me a heart attack for the first three minutes of the of the fourth quarter tonight. <laughs> and I think this was really representative of why right now this might make the most sense to get the most out of Rob Williams. You saw the energy that he brought to this game. It was so different because that game was back and forth. That game was, as Reggie Miller said, I don't know, 700 times that this feels like a playoff atmosphere tonight. And he wasn't wrong. He just said it a lot. But he was right that it felt like that, you know, in that first six, seven, eight minutes when it was real tight. And it was like 20 to 20 or something, you know, in that in that first quarter. And when Rob Williams came in, it, it, the ball just kept finding him. He kept, or he kept finding the ball. Is actually probably mm-hmm. the better way to say it. He yeah. kept finding the ball off of the offensive glass. He was, he was being that terror that you don't know where he's coming from. And he was just allowed to be so active, so free. There's no worrying about fouling out. And you know, we're always going to have a little bit of worry about injuries. But I think the the version that we're getting of Robert Williams in a game like this off the bench, I think this is what as we talked about what it could look like other than just him, you know, managing minutes, this is the version, this is the vision, what we got tonight. And it made me really, really excited to think about what this could look like for the rest of the season. And then into the playoffs. Yeah. And there was a little bit of a chess match going on in that first quarter. Adam and I, when we were talking before the game, um, he, he mentioned how he, he didn't know if this was going to be a game for Rob just because of the way that the Bucks play and that the defense that that would allow them to play with Lopez kind of hanging in the drop position with if Rob was just going to be in the dunker spot. Um, but what they decided to do is they tried to kind of match Rob's minutes with Lopez on the bench. And then very early into Rob's first stint, um, Coach Bud brought Brooke Lopez back in the game to kind of match his minutes back with with Rob. And it really didn't work. You know, I was expecting it to work and it didn't. And Rob just played. He was just the most energetic guy on the court. At one point, Reggie Miller talked about how he had five rebounds and it felt like he had more because four of them were offensive rebounds. Right. And those offensive rebounds are so loud with Robert Williams because he just skies above everybody else. He's, you know, we are podcasting bros uh, first to the floor. Right. Rob is first to touch the sky. Like he's always in the air and he's always getting his hands on balls in the air. So with with Rob. Coming off the bench, as you said, I think that's the perfect spot for him where he only has to play 18 to 22 minutes per game in this very specific role. But as I said on a recent pod, having him come off the bench allows the Celtics to play with one big on the floor and allows them to have four ball handlers on the court at all times. And that's when the Celtics are at their best, when they have four decision makers on the court. Yeah, and this was this was the perfect example of that. Another guy that I I want to shout tonight, I think was was Malcolm Brogdon. I think his stat line looks a little bit worse than actually the game he played. He was six of thirteen. I think some of those misses coming, you know, as him and Derek White were lingering around in that in that fourth quarter with with no Peyton Pritchard as we talked about. Lingerer, man. Linger, it's a real lingerer, man. And so, you know, with Brogdon, 
I thought it was it was towards like the middle to the end of that second quarter. He just gave another guy that was able to get downhill, right? Just another guy who can handle the ball. And I think at times, and you've been correct in this, there's times where his play, his style of play is sometimes a little bit different and occasionally can throw the Celtics for a loop where maybe it sticks a little bit too much. But I think when you look at a matchup of teams like this and when it gets it starts to slow down a little bit in the postseason, the playoffs, having that third guy who's coming in playing 25 minutes, that's a little bit different than the Jays that can also handle the ball. He's shooting, you know, he only, he was over four from three tonight, but had good looks. And I, you know, he's shooting nearly 45% on the season, you know, that can shoot like that off the dribble, off the catch, can get downhill, can get to the rim, can get into the lane and can be another threat, another scorer. You know, I, I thought Malcolm Brogdon was really great in that second half, that second part of the, of, of the second quarter today, excuse me, uh, of just being another guy like, Oh, well, Okay, we know now we're we're super on we're super high alert for the Jays. Wait, Mark. Wait, it's not just Marcus Smart trying to throw up shots or be the third creator. There's another guy in here that can go get them 14, 15, 20 points if needed. And and I thought this was a really great game for for Malcolm Brogdon, uh, especially in that second quarter. Yeah, he also had uh, five assists and four steals. You know, he was very yeah. disruptive on the defensive end. Uh, there were a couple of plays where he just stonewall people in the post. I don't know if you were able to catch any of the Bucks game last night in which Drew Holiday had 51 points in 32 minutes. But Caught the he box just, score. Did not catch the game, though. Bro, he destroyed the Pacer guards. Like, you know how they're kind of feisty every time we've played the Pacers? Like, well, they, they sat a lot of their – like Halliburton and uh, Matherin, a few others sat last night, right? Matherin played. Halliburton Matherin, didn't okay. play. But, they, you know, they have like Nemhart and TJ yeah. McConnell and these guys that are just like kind of feisty defenders – Dude, he took them in the post over and over. He scored like over 20 points with with his left hand in the post. It was like something ridiculous in that game. And they were very easy buckets. And there was one play where Drew tried to take Brogdon in the post and Brogdon just stonewalled him. And he had to take like a fadeaway jump shot. And he wasn't getting to the paint. And if you look at let's just very quickly go to the Bucks box score here. Yeah. Because if you look at Drew Holiday's numbers, two for eight. Um, minus 24 only played 23 minutes in this game, but after coming off of a 51 point game where it was just like really easy, it looked like a yeah. man playing amongst boys. He was going up against grown men tonight. And I think when you look at the Celtics guard rotation with Brogdon white and smart, there's, you have three guys that can guard bigger guards. You know, they're not the best at guarding the little water bug point guards, but they can guard drew holiday. And that's another reason why I think the Celtics are a bad matchup for the bucks. So, so with that, let's kind of transition out of out of the morning box score here, and, and let's start to look at potentially this as a matchup, and, and really this reflects on the the you know the the race to win the Eastern Conference. Either way, teams are going to have to go through the Bucks and the Celtics, and I still think if you know I'll, I'll put money on it that it's going to be Bucks Celtics Eastern Conference Finals. That still seems like the likely matchup, and you know this is where in the Drew Holiday respect, as you were just talking about. Uh, and this also applies to, I think, our matchup with with Philadelphia and and why their guards don't concern me is the Celtics have three different types of guards that are all quality defensive guys that have uh, that have value on the offensive end as well to boot. And I think they just match up so well with all of these guards. There isn't really, you know, Darius Garland in Cleveland is probably the the closest to a water bug point guard that you, you speak of in the Eastern Conference that I get a little bit nervous about if we were to face him. But, you know, the, the teams that I'm really looking at are the Bucks and the Sixers based on the way kind of the, the standings are playing out right now. And it makes me feel really good about our group of guards going up against their group of guards, even if in a vacuum, probably Maxi, Harden, and Holiday. If you're just saying, hey, one on one, who do you want them versus any of the Celtics guards? You're probably going to pick all three of those other guys in a vacuum, but not necessarily within the context of a series. And, and to your point, that makes me feel really good about this as a potential matchup. And, and you were saying earlier that this Bucks matchup, while obviously not underestimating the Bucks, is one that you feel pretty confident about if, if the Celtics end up there in the Eastern Conference Finals against them. Yeah, I think we match up really well with the Bucks. I think we match up really well with the Sixers just because of the deliberate pace that they play. You know the action that you're going to see most of the time from those two teams, right? You're going to see a lot of Giannis driving full speed at you with shooters spread around. You might see some Giannis and Chris Middleton pick and roll action. You might see some Drew, you know, Drew and Brooke Lopez pick and roll action. There's just a lot of pick and roll or just like one guy going one on five against the Celtics because of the style of defense that we play where we switch everything, they 
tend not to have a lot of great ball movement against us, right? So then you look at the Sixers, and what are you expecting there? It's Joel Embiid either at the nail, which is really hard to guard, or it's a Joel Embiid and um, James Harden pick and roll, or Joel Embiid on the mid post, right? So those are three actions that you're getting. That's why Maxi is so important for them because he is that like extra dose of something that they don't really have other than him. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a, why also like in a weird way, I think they should play shake Milton more against us because I think he, he just like kind of gives us some issues just with his ability to, to create. So of those, the top three teams in the East, like those two teams, I feel like we match up against, then you get into Cleveland with Darius Garland, but the, obviously the worst matchup is Donovan Mitchell, mm -hmm. New York, Jalen Brunson, right? I mean, not... quickly can be in that mix a little bit too. Yeah. But those two teams, one of those teams is going to get knocked out right so yeah. we don't have to really worry about that um if we end up with the net somehow like they the style that they're going to play i think could give us some issues it might win them a game or two in the series but there's no way they're going to beat us in a seven game series you get to the heat the, you, we've already talked about the heat enough yeah. on this podcast right then it's like the hawks the raptors and the bulls you're only going to see maybe one of those teams so mm -hmm. you, you don't really have to worry about like what you're going to see there, right? Right now, it's either the Heat or the Hawks. I'm not worried about the Hawks. We've already talked about the Heat, right? So really, it's only going to come down to that probably the second round matchup against if somehow like the Sixers get upset or like in the Eastern Conference Finals, if the Bucks right? get upset in the semifinals, they're, like it's really lining up well for the Celtics to play teams that we match up well against. So this is the... It's... It, it, I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this because it's dumb, right? Because ultimately I would rather take home court against the Bucks than have to avoid playing, you know, like we're kind of alluding to here, the Cavs Knicks winner. I would rather have home court against the Bucks. I think even if there are elements of the Cavs and Knicks that they possess that could give us trouble, I still think we're winning those series. And so mm -hmm. if it's going to determine, you know, us getting the one seed, which is still a very difficult reality even with the win tonight, basically the Celtics still need to win out and then get some help from the Bucks. There's a world in which the Celtics could go three and one and you know, the, the Bucks go one and four. It's, it's, it's basically the Bucks need to lose at least two more games here out of their last couple of games. And the Celtics need to be either three and one or four and zero oh in their final four games for that to even matter. But what's shaping up is that there's a world in which this two seed could actually be the better path for the Celtics than bumping up to that one seed. And I see here you've got you got a tweet pulled up. Let's uh I'll let you take it here. This is from February 21st when the Boston Celtics were in first place. I tweeted this out. I said, I kind of hope this happens even if it means Celtics lose home court. I think it's realistic and helps the Celtics avoid matchup nightmares. I think there'd be a real possibility the Knicks <laughs> upset the Sixers too. So I have the Bucks at the one, Celtics Sorry, two. Was, go ahead, go ahead. I'm laughing at the bottom of, of, of this prediction. <laughs> oh, but the Wizards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Philly three, Cleveland four, Miami five, Knicks six, Wizards and Hawks seven and eight. Not going to happen. I, that was me thinking yeah. that the Wizards might still be there. Um, the the Nets would fall into the seven eight matchup, and I thought mm -hmm. the Wizards might be able to beat the Nets in the seven seven eight matchup. Yeah. Um, and as we saw, the Wizards are a problem, man. They just freaking whooped us. Hey, man. Zinger's Porzingis, back. Zinger's Porzingis Zinger's back. for MVP. Dude, but, he looked great in that game. But but this is why, like, although I, I didn't feel great about tweeting this because I just figured people would get upset by this, it's kind of playing out exactly how I saw it happening. You know, maybe this was like some touch by an angel. I'm about to turn 34. <laughs> you know, it's two days before my birthday. Maybe this was Twitter God's gift to me that I can always come back to this. But it's looking like this is kind of how the Eastern Conference is shaking out. The, the Bucks getting the one seed, Celtics and Philly matching up in the second round. And as we've said, the Sixers, yeah, they they could cause some issues. They've got Joel Embiid, who's probably going to be the MVP of the league, but they don't match up with match up yeah, well. They with just us. they just don't scare me. Like I, I here's the thing. I was thinking once again. I was thinking about this earlier today. If the Celtics end up on the path that it's looking like right now, where it would likely be Miami in the first round, just bleh, ugh, God, I just I just don't want to do it. We're gonna win that series in six games. Maybe five, but it probably will go six or seven, just knowing the way that Spolstra and, and, and Jimmy and Bam play uh, in the postseason. And then it goes to Philly. And, you know, with Philly, Embiid's probably going to average, what, 35, 13, and, and five in that series. But I, I, I don't think the parts around him, as we're talking about right now, are going to be enough 
to get to get them by the Celtics with everything else the Celtics have that they can throw at Joel Embiid to help slow him down, which he does himself enough, as we've seen in second halves of games in that series go longer. Embiid gets a little bit more tired, takes a little bit, you know, too many, too many shots farther away from the basket. And so you couple that with what we can throw at Maxi and Harden and we know all about playoff Harden. So, you know, you throw that all into the mix, and it's just hard for me to get too worried about Philly, despite the Embiid factor. You got to give Embiid at least the respect of that. No, I feel you. And we play the Sixers uh, next week, right? Yeah, we played them on Tuesday. So it's a really interesting schedule. So let's take a quick break here, and we'll come back, and let's, let's take a look at the Celtics' remaining schedule here down the stretch. So right now, the Celtics, after this win against the Bucs, as I said, it's still a long shot to pull off the one seed. Basically, in these last final, let me see, they have one, two, three, four, five games, five more games here. Basically, the Celtics have to go either four and one or five and oh, and then get a little bit of help from, from the Bucs with them going uh, basically three and two. If the Celtics go five and oh, and, Celt- and the Bucs go three and two, Celtics would get the one seed. So they need them to go at least three and two down the stretch here to have any type of chance. So that's going to be tough. And the Bucs don't have that daunting of a schedule. So it, it, it will be tough to make that happen. But just looking at the Celtics schedule here, they have the Jazz tomorrow on a back to back reporting this on Thursday, right after the game. They've got the Jazz at home and then they've got a big game. They've got a couple days off, which is really nice. So they're going to have the weekend off and then they'll play Tuesday night against the Sixers and depending what the Sixers do between now and then that's going to be a game where the Celtics are going to need to bring it like they did tonight because the Sixers aren't that far behind the Celtics from coming to grab that two seed so that will be the one of the last final major tests for the Celtics in the regular season is that Tuesday night matchup against the 76ers yeah so it's really important for the Celtics to take care of business against Utah which is a home game, right? So we're back home for that game. Then we're on the road for Philly. And then we end with a three game homestand. Yep. Cause if we beat Utah and then beat Philly, theoretically we can just chill the last three games. Cause we're probably not going to catch Milwaukee for the one seed, as you said, and we'll be three games up on Philly in the loss column. Right? So we have three games left. They can't really catch us. We'll have the tiebreaker. So we can really just chill. And I think that's important because when you look at those last three games back to back against the Raptors, like we might see the Raptors in the first round of playoffs. You know, yeah, that's a that's be. a possibility. So like you don't want to show too much of your hand in those back to back. We could matches. see the Hawks too. The Hawks we are could. also who play. So exactly. So like I think it's important for the Celtics to take care of business the next two games, kind of see where they're at and they can just rest guys the last week of the season. They could play one of those games, you know, just to keep the guys fresh. They could just experiment with different lineups as we saw in the fourth quarter. I know we mentioned earlier, Will, you were scared about Robert Williams being on the court in the fourth quarter. <laughs> I that man kinda, bubble wrap in the fourth. I actually kind of liked that lineup though, because it was Brogdon, White, Grant, Sam, and Rob. You know, so if there's like a weird situation in which the Jays are both in foul trouble, like maybe that's a lineup that Missoula just wanted to get point. a look at, you know, so uh, just quick thought on that, but a quick tangent um, looking at this. So what are your initial thoughts on that? Uh, the idea that the Celtics might need to not show their hand the last week of the season. I, I mean, I think it's going to depend a little bit on what happens with the with, with the Bucks at that point. You, you know, obviously, you got to take care of your business against the Sixers game. I think the Celtics, and we're jumping past the Jazz game here, which I hope the Celtics are not overlooking the way that we are right now. Because it's but, a home game and the Jazz are officially like tanking out there. Yeah. I think we'll be fine in that one. I think we'll be okay too. Um, it is a back to back, which we, we should mention. The Bucks were on a back to back tonight. I know we've kind of alluded to it. But they were on a back to back. Give them, you know, they played this. They played the summer league Pacers, but still, a back to back is a back to back. You know, but but I think for the Celtics, they need to treat that 76ers game like I said, like they treated tonight. That needs to be treated like a playoff game. I think. I think that's one where you're not necessarily going to show everything, but you're going to come out with the, you know, we're, we're, we're guaranteeing ourselves that two seed. This is us locking up the two seed tonight. And then from there, you'll have the results of whatever happened because the, the Bucks next game is against the 76ers. So that's yeah. kind of a weird one where depending on if you're leaning into that two seed, you kind of actually want, you know, the, the Bucks to win that, which hurts your chances for the one, or you go the reverse. And, you know, it, so it depends w- what you're kind of rooting for in that one. But then you'll also have a Bucks wizards result by the end of Tuesday night. So I think from then, then you'll be able to look at those last three games and if you're one game back you know I think you kind of got to still go for that one seed because at the end of the day like I said if I have to you know the even if the two seed path 
to the finals, I think looks a little bit easier. It can always be deceptive. We thought last year the Nets, everyone was ducking the smoke with the Nets. The team who didn't was the Celtics. They end up in the finals anyways. So, you know, I, I think even if that path may look more difficult, at the end of the day, we know that Milwaukee's game tonight was not their best. We've seen them play a lot better. We know they're going to be a lot better. I mean, shit, Drew Holiday just had 51-8-8 yesterday. I don't care if it's for some league Pacers. Like, that's an impressive-ass stat line. And we know how scary Giannis is. And we've seen what Middleton, when he's right, can do specifically against the Celtics. So if I have to choose between the two, I'm going to assess this at the end of Tuesday night and make a call. If we're one game back, Let's keep going because then all it takes is one and we got the tiebreaker. So yeah. you having that tiebreaker in your back pocket's huge. If it's still a two game deficit with three games to go after that game against the Sixers, that's when I kind of say, Hey, listen, if we do what we need to take care of business against the Sixers, I'm 100% prioritizing health over everything else. I don't give a shit about these last three games. You know, we're going to get our guys out there. We're going to keep them in a rhythm. But if that means, you know, in the second half of games, we get a little bit more J.D. Davison, some Muscala. <laughs> I'd some, like to see that. I'd like to you know see what I'm saying? JD, like, like, man. Like, I, I, like I, I, would, I would opt for that route. But I think for me, it, it really can't be assessed until the end of Tuesday night. Yeah, those of you that are tuning in on YouTube, we'd love to also kind of hear your thoughts just in the, in the comment section. What, do you, what are you feeling right now? Do you want to go for the one seed? Do you want to go for the two seed? Um, just like dro drop your feelings in the chat. But Will, so like looking at the Raptors back to back, mm -hmm. you know, there's a chance that we play the Raptors in the first round. Do you think there's any chance like those two games, the fact that the Raptors play such a weird physical style could like not spell doom for the Celtics, but cause that first round to be a little bit more difficult than it might need to be? I mean, I I've always viewed the Raptors kind of similar to how I view the Heat. They're going to be a nuisance. Like, I think both teams are well coached. I think both teams have uh, some very high, some very high tier, high end talent. They don't have the depth. That's where mm -hmm. both of them run to the issue. You have, you know, with the Heat, you've got the the Jimmy, Bam, Tyler Hero group. You go over to the Raptors. You know, Scotty Barnes has been picking it up in year two, year guy. You know, Pascal Siakam, he's going to be right there on, you know, the the fringes of my third team, all NBA when we get into it. Uh, Fred Van Vliet can get hot since they've got Jakob Pertl. They've played a lot better, you know, since that, since that move kind of give them a little bit more of a traditional feel where they go away from just being super rangy and lengthy and now having an actual traditional center to kind of run offense through um so i mean i think toronto is not going to be a cakewalk if that ends up being the the first round of the playoffs i view them basically the same way that i view i view the heat in that that should be and i and i will say it will be a victory in a, in a seven game series but there's a chance that could go six that could go seven and it wouldn't surprise me so i i mean the raptors raptors and heat to me are the worst case scenario of who we would get at seven Hawks and even though the Bulls give us trouble, I always struggle with the Bulls. The Bulls do always tend to to give us trouble. I still think getting the Hawks or the Bulls would be the the ultimate preference if it somehow works its way out for that to be the seventh seed. Yeah, I don't I don't see the Bulls having any opportunity they're too to far get back. it. I'm yeah, they're too far back. Yeah. We'd only play them if we got the one seed. Got the one seed, exactly. So yeah. it's likely between the Hawks, Raptors, and Heat are, are going to be the three options. And if I have to rank them, I'd go Heat. I mean, excuse me, Hawks are my number one preference. Mm -hmm. And then I'd, I, I see this is where I struggle with, with Toronto and Miami because. You know, Jimmy Butler and Bam, I think, reign supreme in my in the argument in my head between Toronto and Miami. But with Toronto, I can go at least six guys deep that I'm like, damn, that's a, that's a look at those six. That top six is pretty good. Like that's a really impressive top six. But I think just given the the history with with Miami, I'd probably go Atlanta's my number one preference, Toronto number two, and then Miami number three. What about you? Would you rank it the same way? Um, yeah, probably. I think Atlanta, we, we match up really well with them. I'm not scared of Trey Young. They don't have the size that scares me. Um, the Heat, I mean, there still is an outside chance that the Heat sneak into the sixth seed. They're a game and a half behind the Nets right now. I haven't looked yeah. at their schedules. Uh, the Heat have not been playing well of late. So no, the fact that. that they're kind of fizzling out right now themselves, it's like, yeah, they might Bad win loss for them to the Knicks last night. I don't know if you caught some of that game. No. Brunson Brunson didn't really play a ton. Was a little bit banged up. Randall went down. That was a out big for the rest loss of the, for the Knicks. Out for the rest of the regular season. Seems like maybe he should be back, but at this point, everybody's just kind of given that you know the old KG info where there's no info or not enough info to really make a call. And so, 
the Knicks won that game by by ten or just about by double digits last night against a Heat team that's that's fighting for their lives to get out of the play in. So the Heat the Heat are just running. I was saying this today to uh, to our buddy Liptak. You know the the Heat have run out of time living on the margins. Yeah. Like Kyle Lowry not being the Kyle Lowry they thought they were getting, Duncan Robinson regressing, and now it's I mean, you look around and they're 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 on borrowed time with Kevin Love and Victor Oladipo, and then they've got a bunch of G League guys. I like Gabe Vincent, but he's still, you know, he's he's in you know an accelerated G League guy. They got one of the whichever Martin brother they got, Haywood Highsmith. Like, you know, <laughs> what was I calling him last time? Hightower. <laughs> yeah. Dante Hightower is out there, you know, great middle linebacker, not so great three and D, but no. <laughs> but yeah, they're just on borrow time with with not having the the top tier talent they need to support Jimmy and Bam. And so it's just hard to be too worried about about the heat at this point. I feel that. I want to spend the last couple of minutes, Will, just taking a quick look at the Western Conference, just because yeah, we haven't talked about that in a while. So this is how the Western Conference currently shakes out. You got the Nuggets at the one seed, three and a half games up on the Grizzlies, who are two up on the Kings. So it looks like the one through three are pretty set. And then you've got a really interesting race for the four seed right now with the Suns currently a half game up on the Clippers that are playing some decent ball right now, despite Paul George being out. Russell mm-hmm. Westbrook, by the way, had a crazy game last night without Kawhi. He like he's, he's been pretty good for them. I thought it was a terrible move at the time, and especially the way it started. But he's he's been I think I think Paul George not being there helps his case being there. Definitely. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And then you get the Warriors right now hanging on to that six seed. Uh, the T Wolves and Lakers right now would be the first play in game, which is actually a really fun uh, matchup mm-hmm. there. And then right now, the nine and 10 are the Pelicans and the Thunder, which means our guy Kyrie Irving is currently outside of the play in. <laughs> Luca outside Dude, of the play in. Like maybe that hurt. Maybe that hurts. Can I ask you a quick NBA question? I was just about to ask you, would. When we when we do our all NBA and everything here in uh you know in just just a week and a half or so probably by the time we're gonna have that week off for the Celtics so we're gonna have to fill that with a little bit of play in talk plus you know do some of our awards if the Mavericks finish in eleventh place they don't even make the play in tournament would you keep Luca off your all NBA teams altogether based on the criteria that that you've had so far I might dude because like. <laughs> SGA on the my last one in the third quarter rankings, I had him off just because of his team like not playing as well as they could. Um, mm-hmm. They were, I think they were like three games under five hundred at the time. But if they sneak in, if the Thunder beat the Mavericks for that ten seed, like if I have to pick between the two of those guys, I'd probably pick SGA. There's like no yep. reason why I shouldn't. He's been amazing this year. Um, so I'd have to look at everything, but I'd be leaning towards at least Luca being third team. I don't know if I'd leave yeah. him off altogether, but he'd probably fall down to third. I'm, team. I'm the same way. I don't think I can leave him off altogether, but uh, if they don't even make the play in, he's not making my first team. I'll just say that he Hell can't make no. my first team. If you don't, Hell no. if you don't make the play in, but looking out West right now. And I asked, uh, you know, let me ask you this. Cause I asked Adam this uh, a couple episodes ago. So with the bucks as the one seed in the East Celtics as the two seed Philly is the three seed. What I told him was, I think if any of those three teams come out of the East, I'm picking them to win the NBA Finals. I think all three of those teams are better than everybody in the West now. Actually, you know what? I just think the three of those teams are better than everybody in the West. Agree or disagree? I need to see the Suns. Uh, I haven't seen enough of them yet, obviously. They were the wild card that I admitted to. That it's like, and that was before. I and mean, obviously, Kevin Durant just came back last night, a little bit rusty. They did get a, win, a nice win uh, against the Timberwolves, but Kevin Durant was a little bit rusty in that game. And they were the one wild card that I kind of leaned into. Where I was like, yeah, I, it, it's hard to judge that because at the time there'd only been three games, now four games with Kevin Durant on that team. Like, is it crazy to say like outside of the Suns and Warriors just because we match up poorly against them and they just. And then took our lunch money last finals. Like, do I fear the Lakers the third most? <laughs> like, I might. I don't know, man. It's. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I know our guy. We got. Let me put him up here. Our guy Xavier Woods got a uh, Lakers in four here in the in the chat. Yeah, I don't. I don't know about that one, man. But but keep trying. But Lakers in four years, maybe. <laughs> yeah, might have a whole new cast of characters there. We'll see. But yeah, I mean, that's that's the crazy part, right? Like. I don't know, man. I mean, with the West, I've started to just lean into, yeah, it's crazy. And you, you can call it parody, and, and it's probably partially true it's parody, but is it also not just partly mediocrity? 
are these teams not just all mediocre? And we're acting like, man, it's so crazy. Someone's coming from the six. Someone's coming from the seven. Mm-hmm. I mean, likely if you're not going to be one of those top four seeds, I, I don't think you're you're coming out of the West. Memphis has been starting to play a lot better ball. Lately. Yeah, I, that's, so, that, that was the other team that I was going to throw out there. I, I know that I said I, I didn't fear them early in the season, but Jaron Jackson, he's been a revelation. He's, been, he's last, been a lot like, different. He's been games. And he's been settling into so one of the biggest issues I know you have was that Dylan Brooks is going to Dylan Brooks and he still sucks mm-hmm. like that's 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 still a fact he's still he's still shitty but he's not going to feel like he needs to Dylan Brooks as much if Jaron Jackson is doing what Jaron Jackson has become and you have that with obviously what Ja brings you and what Desmond Bain brings you and so then there becomes a more natural hierarchy to it but if Jaron Jackson is, has been playing you know not you know how he was earlier in the year or last year when Ja goes out, then it becomes Dylan Brooks is becomes the I got this type mm-hmm. of guy, you know, and that's not the that's not the Dylan Brooks that anybody wants to see. No, no, Dylan Brooks, if he played a role and just said I will take five shots a game and just be a pest on defense, like that's the perfect role for yeah. Dylan Brooks. If I, my issue with him is the the weird shots that he takes in shot selection. For sure, Jaron Jer- Jackson, he's like, I mean. You can make the argument he's playing as well as a Bam Adebayo is, like on both ends of the court. Like he's that good on offense now. Like that's how yep. well he's been playing. He got a, he, he got some votes in that MVP straw poll today. Yeah, it's a little much, but uh, little, well, I mean, he got he was like a twelfth on. He got like one fifth place vote. Okay. But my, okay, my my point being, his name was in the conversation. Yeah, definitely, and I you know I think his defense is great. Um, his left hand drives are awesome. I don't know if you've watched enough Grizzlies lately, but he goes to the rack strong and he spins back to that left hand. Um, it's just able to finish over everybody because he's so freaking big. Uh, I, yeah, the Grizzlies, if they made it to the finals, I wouldn't be surprised. I agree. I like that idea that, you know, is it parody or is it mediocrity? So um, I so like let's, that. Let's, let's end on this, Greg. Right now, there's still about a, you know, a week plus left in the season. Looking at the Western Conference, give me your Western Conference winner. Phoenix Suns. Yeah, I agree. I, I, even though we've seen four games, <laughs> which is like, it, it's so laughable to say out loud. We've seen four games of what this team actually looks like, but that's how little I believe in, in the guy. Like, I, I know we both picked the Nuggets to be in the finals and we should be riding with that because they've, they've been the one seed basically wire to wire in the Western Conference. I just don't trust that defense, man. And when I look at some of the teams that I think can beat them, there's a lot of them in the West that I think could beat them. And it's just, it's just hard to think that that's gonna, that they're going to hold up for three different series to be able to, to get to the finals. And so I'm with you. I would, I would bet on, on the unknown greatness of Kevin Durant and the wild card that is the Phoenix Suns. Is yeah. I'd go is. Suns, second pick Grizzlies, third pick Warriors. If Andrew Wiggins comes back. Yeah, that's a weird situation, man. Don't don't know what's going on there, but uh, I would love to see Wiggins get back, even though that's that's probably the one team out west definitively. If Wiggins is back, that I look at for the Celtics in a, a much down the line NBA Finals matchup, where it's like, oof, that one is still a problem. That one is still a problem. But Sands Wiggins, I would really like our chances in that game. But hey, man, late night post post game recording this is a lot of fun appreciate everybody that joined in on this joyous night celtics take down the bucks 140 to 99 sit two games back of the one seed with just five games remaining make sure that y'all are staying locked in with us here at green with envy we appreciate y'all support we'll be back later in the week with more but for now any final thoughts greg and then let us know what we're gonna hear on the way out Bro, no shout out to Blue Wire at the end. Shout out Blue yeah. Wire for yeah, that's Blue Wire. That's our, that's our family. I, I mean, I figured we, we wait for the three man weave and we we talk a little bit more about that this upcoming weekend. Yeah, we could talk about it just like in in passing right now. Signed with Blue Wire, made headlines shout out to our new Blue Wire family. Yeah, yeah, that's man. Good news. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy that uh, we're at Blue Wire now. So shout out to everyone that's been rocking with us. And with that, you are going to hear some music from my band down here in Austin, Texas. We are Black Sheep Optimists, and this one is called Skywalking. Peace, everybody. Peace.